Hey guys, today we're going to talk about causality as a corollary of identity from chapter one of Leonard Peikoff's book, Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand. Stay tuned. All right, so today's topic is causality, the law of cause and effect. And Ayn Rand describes thinking as the process of defining identity and discovering causal connections. So if you think that the typical context in which people are thinking about causality is like a scientific context of discovering scientific laws, Ayn Rand is seeing it, it actually runs throughout her entire philosophy. It's certainly relevant to discovering scientific laws. But if you think in ethics, central to her concept of ethics is discovering the cause and effect relationships between the actions that will lead to the achievement of our goals. And as I'll talk about more later, I mean, her whole conception of what it means to be a moral person is to be what she calls a disciple of causation. Or if you think about her moral defense of capitalism, she says that the court's ruling principle is justice, which means that people are able to enjoy the effects of the causes they enact, and they can't impose the effects of the causes they enact on others. And so this is an omnipresent principle. Like every other axiom, now, as we'll see, this is a corollary to the axioms, but it functions the same way in the sense that it needs to be omnipresent in our thinking, that we need to be thinking in causal terms, and that, and that so much of what goes wrong in people's lives is precisely when they reject causality, when they reject it by seeking effects without the causes, causes without regard for the effects, and this really fascinating phenomenon that she, Ayn Rand talks about, which is reversing cause and effect. So here's how she describes reversing causality, pursuing effects under the delusion it will give you the cause. Quote, the corollary of the causeless in matter is the unearned in spirit. Whenever you rebel against causality, your motive is the fraudulent desire not to escape it, but worse, to reverse it. You want unearned love, as if love, the effect, could give you personal value, the cause. You want unearned admiration, as if admiration, the effect, could give you virtue, the cause. You want unearned wealth, as if wealth, the effect, could give you ability, the cause. And she goes on to say, you support the doctrines of your teachers, while they run hog wild, proclaiming that and here she's referencing Keynes, spending the effect creates riches the cause, that referencing Marx, machinery the effect creates intelligence the cause, and that referencing Freud, your sexual desires, the effect create your philosophic values the cause. And one example of this that really struck home with me is I remember watching a documentary about gangs, and, and I had heard this before, but there's just this kind of deep focus on like, I want respect, I demand that people respect me, like the constant talk about respect. And it's essentially, I think this, the same phenomenon of reversing cause and effect as if respect from others, random passerby in the street will give you self-esteem, character, the cause. And so, you know, the broad point here is that causality is a central concept in the philosophy, a central concept in life, a central concept in our ability to enjoy life and create a society where people can enjoy life. So that's what we're going to explore. We'll talk a little bit more about the cash value of this concept at the end. So let me just quickly summarize what Leonard uh, covers in this section. So he starts out by talking about the actual development in like a child of the implicit grasp of the axioms and he talks in particular about how there's certain kind of ingredients that one has to grasp in order to grasp causality specifically you have to get entity identity action and then what you are able to do is perceive causality you're able to actually isolate and notice in the world entities acting according to their nature and so then he goes on and clarifies the objectivist understanding of causality as entities acting in accordance with their nature contrasting it for example with the idea that every entity has a cause which objectivism rejects and with the humean notion that what causality about is, is about is events causing events and then he ends by stressing that causality is inherent in existence that it's not as he puts it a metaphysical afterthought but that to be is to be something specific and to act in accordance with your specific identity. 
So the first thing that should be really striking about this section is the fact that Leonard starts by talking about the development of the axioms and the way in which a child would grasp axiomatic concepts. And in fact, it actually takes a a pretty good amount of time before we get to causality proper in a discussion of causality. So this should jump out at us as something really interesting, particularly because we have to remember that, uh, you know, if you read the introduction or if you've heard Leonard talk about OPAR, it is extremely, extremely thought, th thought through in terms of how it's structured so that it's, it's intentionally hierarchical down to the sentence to the extent that's possible that this comes first and this comes after that and this comes after that and one of the things you might have noticed if you've heard lectures like understanding objectivism or objectivism state of the art these are lectures leonard gave before opar was finalized and published um, is that he gives different versions of the hierarchy and so it's important to understand what's going on here because you might think wait like didn't he give us existence uh, con existence, consciousness, and identity in chapter one, and now he's talking about the chronological development is going from existence to entity to identity to action to causality to consciousness. Like, what what is going on here? And it's that I think as Leonard was developing his thinking, what wasn't fully clear until some point during the writing of this book was that there's a distinction between the chronological hierarchy of knowledge and the logical or philosophic hierarchy of knowledge. The chronological hierarchy is just how a person would actually have to develop the kind of implicit grasp and later explicit grasp of different items of knowledge. Whereas the philosophic hierarchy is now we as adults are trying to organize logically a system of ideas. So we need to know what are foundations and then what are derivatives and that those things aren't completely unrelated but they're not the same so philosophically the foundations of human knowledge are the three basic axioms which we grasp simultaneously that is that the facts conceptualized by the axioms are this are all there in the act of opening our eyes here's how ayn rand puts it existence exists and the act of grasping that statement implies two corollary axioms that something exists which one perceives, and that one exists possessing consciousness, consciousness being the faculty of perceiving that which exists. And so there's no order to the basic axioms. They come at once. Now you have to have an order of actually like writing them out and explaining them um, because you can't say everything literally in the same, you know, in the same sentence, in the same breath. But that's all at the foundation. That's contained in the act of opening your eyes. But what Leonard is drawing our attention to is the fact that you, as a child, can't get them implicitly at the same time. And I mean, this is a point Ayn Rand makes in Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, I think particularly the appendix, where she talks about that this would have to undergo a development. And so Leonard's going through this development. He's going through the way in which existence is there from the time an infant would open its eyes to being able to see, oh, there's entities, there's a world of entities, and then grasping implicitly identity, and then being able to notice, well, these entities have certain characteristics, and and one of those characteristics being action, and being able to grasp implicitly the axiomatic concept of action, and then what that is going to enable them to go on, and now we're going to get to causality. So the reason I'm pointing this out is, one, just so you're not confused when you encounter different versions of the hierarchy or you see even within opar there's it, it seems like he's giving a different ordering to things it's that you're dealing with different uh hierarchies um you're looking at the development of knowledge from different perspectives it's, you know the or again it's the adult organization of philosophic knowledge and versus the actual uh ways in which a child would grasp this but i'm stressing it here in terms of causality because as we're going to talk a lot about for objectivism, grasping causality as a principle is you do that perceptually. But you, but in order to do it perceptually, there has to be a context there in order to notice it. In order for causality to jump out at you from the world you're observing, you first would have to observe and implicitly grasp over time these preceding ideas, particularly this idea of uh, entity, identity, action. And so that, that's really why Leonard's laying this groundwork, because if you didn't have in mind 
that there is this previous axiomatic knowledge that's grasped by a child, then you couldn't get the way in which grasping causality would be perceptual. And that's really the most key point here, uh, or at least it's a major aspect of a key point that we're going to cover in some detail. All right, so what is causality? And it's really fascinating. I want to run through some quotes from different objectivist thinkers that I think help illuminate that there's a shared conception of causality, but really getting the precise way to formulate it and draw out its implications. Um, there's there's some, if, if you, I don't know if that you want to call it controversy, but there's some disagreements that are really fascinating and will help us think through at a deeper level how to understand cause and effect. So let's start with Ayn Rand. She says, the law of causality is the law of identity applied to action. All actions are caused by entities. The nature of an action is caused and determined by the nature of the entities that act. A thing cannot act in contradiction to its nature. Then two quotes from Leonard. In any given set of circumstances, therefore, there is only one action possible to an entity, the action expressive of its identity. This is the action it will take, the action that is caused and necessitated by its nature. Next quote, every action has a cause, the cause is the nature of the entity which acts, and the same cause leads to the same effect. The same entity under the same circumstances will perform the same action. Here's a quote from Nathaniel Brandon. This is an article on, uh, from an article on causality and volition published in The Objectivist, which uh, Ayn Rand regarded as expressive or definitive of her views on these issues. He says, The actions possible to an entity are determined by its nature. What a thing can do depends on what it is. It is not chance. It is not the whim of a supernatural being. It is in the inexorable nature of the entities involved, that a seed can grow into a flower, but a stone cannot, that a bird can fly, but a building cannot, that electricity can run a motor, but tears and prayers cannot, that actions consistent with their natures are possible to entities, but contradictions are not. Just as what a thing can do depends on what it is, so in any specific situation, what a thing will do depends on what it is. If iron is exposed to certain temperature, it expands. If water is exposed to the same temperature, it boils. If wood is exposed to the same temperature, it burns. The differences in their actions are caused by the differences in their properties. If an automobile collides with a bicycle, it is not chance that the bicycle is hurled into the air rather than the automobile. If an automobile collides with a train, it is not chance that the automobile is hurled into the air rather than the train. Causality proceeds from identity. And I go into this at length because one of the principles of objectivism, one of the things Ayn Rand insisted upon, is that when you're that you can't basically dictate science from. Um, from metaphysics. And so when we're formulating something like the law of causality, it needs to be leave open the different kinds of causal relationships and forms of causality that we encounter in the world. And so the most obvious area where this comes up, right, is in you cannot define cause causality in a way that discounts and may, and would leave impossible free will because free will as we'll get to is also axiomatic it is foundational it is self-evident and so in in the the as we'll see um later on in opar the way that uh leonard understands the causality of free will and that brandon does the way that they they uh, see free will as being consistent with the idea of that causality necessitates an entity under the same conditions um, taking the same action is that they see the action as choosing so the action is not choosing x it's not the content of the choice and but uh, other objectivists have worried that this that the way that leonard and um you know usually they don't, I don't even bring up brandon's article but the way that rand and brandon uh and peacock are, are defining causality um, has the flavor of determinism or does imply determinism and that actually you cannot, uh, that, that it's misleading or wrong in some way to talk about the same, you know, um, entity under the same conditions taking the same action 
in the context of free will that no, you need to think about it as there's choice A and choice B, and those are different actions under the same circumstances. And um, I don't want to like, I, I, I'm not going to come down here and give this is the definitive right answer. But what I wanted to highlight is that this is sort of what the area of disagreement is. What everybody agrees in is that there is a universal law of causality. It's a relationship between entity and identity. And so it's how do we formulate it in the right way? And let me just give an example of a different way of thinking about causality, um, but that's still under the same umbrella of a fundamental agreement. And this is what Harry Binswinger outlines in his book, How We Know. So Harry says, the actions possible to an entity are determined by its identity, by what it is. And elsewhere, he says, what an entity can do is determined by what it is. And then he has a footnote that makes explicit the difference here. Here I might be in disagreement with Rand's view of causality since I see it as involving what an entity can do and some of her statements are phrased in terms of what an entity will do. And so he goes on to say that, yeah, at, a, at the level of material reality, that those um, what an entity can do is deterministic, but that, in, but that is not universal and... So, you know, there's no problem in understanding free will because what a human being can do is select between alternatives. And so that's sort of like how this gets parsed out at the level of the most, you know, complex thing, which is the human being and, and the mind and the kind of causal, uh, the causal capacities that we have, which are different from inanimate matter. Um, but you can also look at it from the other perspective, which is how does this apply at the subatomic level? And here I want to read a quote. This is from a footnote in Jason Ryan's article in the Blackwell Companion to Ayn Rand, where he's writing on the objectivist metaphysics. And here's what he has to say. Quote, our notion of deterministic action, which is not self-evident, is applied by us to physical bodies and quite successfully judging by the progress of the physical sciences since the 17th century. However, in my view at least, Rand's principles of causality and identity do not guarantee that at every physical level science will ever discover that one antecedent state will produce one and only one consequent state. The nature of a cause determines and delimits it to performing actions from a finite range of effects, and things cannot act contrary to their nature by doing what is beyond their range of possible actions. But their nature may be such as to give rise to a limited disjunctive set of outcomes from one and the same initial condition. I must stress that this is my own opinion as to what objectivist metaphysics need and need not be committed to with respect to causality, i.e. it need not assume that there is a strict one-to-one -one determinacy of all physical actions. Rand herself may have accepted more than this, though, taking all physical causation to be deterministic. If so, it is unknown to me how strongly she held this view and for what reasons. It may not have been a conscious theoretical commitment, but simply a default assumption. She may not have taken notice of this point. It is also conceivable that her view was colored by prevailing interpretations of quantum mechanics at the time, e.g. the Copenhagen interpretation, which she regarded as a rejection of non-contradiction, as did some of its formulators, such as Bohr, if her understanding of the situation was that some physicists doubted or denied a strict one-to-one -one physical determinacy because they rejected the axiom of identity, then she probably would not have seen any strong reason to consider such a possibility. However, as we saw earlier, Rand deliberately avoided legislating the ontology of undiscovered physical things from the throne of metaphysics. Therefore, I believe that my interpretation is in the proper spirit of her fundamental views regarding identity and causality. So you can see there's some thorny issues here, but the, the foundational point stands is that there's a necessary relationship between an entity and its actions, one rooted in its identity, and that a thing cannot act in contradiction to its nature. And, th and so that's, in a sense, the settled issue. And then there's these kind of... Um, further questions about how exactly to formulate that. We're not going to settle it right here, right now, but that could be something interesting to think about and, you know, discuss if you're reading this with a group. So how do we validate the law of causality? Well, Leonard stresses that causality is a corollary to the axioms. It's the law of identity applied to action. But he also 
uh, stresses the point here and elsewhere that this is not a deductive proof of causality, that you don't prove causality, that the kind of rationalist approach would be, okay, there's three alternatives, right? A thing can act in accordance with its identity, it could act apart from its identity, or it could act in contradiction to its identity, the latter two are impossible, and therefore it must act uh, in accordance with its identity. And he makes the point of like, well, if you're just going to play rationalistic games, rationalists love to come up with like three alternatives or five alternatives and refute things. And well, the last man standing must be true. But he points out that, you know, a clever person will say, well, why can't something act sometimes in accordance with this identity and sometimes from a, uh, an inner spontaneity, I think he calls it. And there's no answer on it, on that kind of approach that, what we're doing when we're, is really integrating causality with identity. But in terms of how it's actually validated, it is, as I've said, self-evident. Once you have the requisite context that you can focus on an entity acting, you see it acting in accordance with this identity. And that's how you grasp causality. So it's my pushing causes the ball to roll. You literally see that. Um, it's, you know, my drinking of the water quenches my thirst. These are, you're, you're experiencing directly causality. You're perceiving directly causality. And that's the validation. That's the validation of the inexorable link between identity and action. There's nothing further. It's not something you argue for. There's nothing further to say about it, except that I'm perceiving the relationship between an entity, its identity, and its actions. So Leonard makes this point that objectivism's view of causality is, and I forget if he says exactly this in Opar, but it's it's from the Aristotelian tradition of understanding causality, but that modern in modern times, really since um, it, it was a view that was popularized by Galileo, by Hume, of thinking about causality as a relationship between successive states. That is, we, reserve, we observe certain regularities between events. Um, and then the question is, how do we know that those, regu that those regularities between events are necessary? How do we know that what happened tomorrow uh, will reflect the same thing that happened today? And what Leonard is stressing is that that is not the objectivist view and the the basic reason is that there there are no free floating events. There are no free floating um, you know actions leading to actions. There are enti what we observe is entities acting in accordance with their nature, not free floating events. And that's why you know even the standard example of the billiard ball, like this motion leading to that motion, you can't drop out the identity of the entities involved because you know if you did the same thing with soap bubbles or an egg or something or even tennis ball like you would get a different action and and so we have to take seriously that what we're grasping is the relationship between identity and action and it's important it's the identity of the entity so it's wrong to think of it as um the the shape of the ball causes the rolling no it's the ball and the it, it, all of its characteristics um it's we're grasping the relationship between the full identity of the entity and its actions and again this is important because if you think if if you just had it as the shape of the ball causes the rolling well what about the shape of a bubble it's the same shape but different action because the identity of the entity is different but the other thing I want to stress is that it's what we perceive when we perceive causality is not regularity. So it's not that we form a, it, our, uh, the law of causality by observing, oh, the ball rolled 20 times, uh, I pushed it, and therefore balls always roll. Um, it's you're perceiving the, the, that when I push a ball, it rolls. That's perceiving causality. And you perceive that in a single instance. It's the, a necessary connection between the identity and the action that's being perceived. Whereas, uh, and this comes up in, in Leonard's um, lectures on induction and in physics, the fact that you perceive a regularity does not necessarily tell you anything true about causality. So 
for example, you would not get causality from seeing the sun rise every day. You might get, oh, this is a causal, this is a potential causal connection. There might be some causal connection there and it's worth exploring, but you're not perceiving the causality, you're just perceiving irregularity. So one thing that I wanna underscore is when we say that causality is perceptual, that we perceive causality, it doesn't mean we perceive every causal connection. Uh, in fact, I mean, the vast majority of causal connections have to be established in much more difficult, challenging, sophisticated ways. And in fact, what epistemology and applied epistemology, like, you know, the uh, epistemology of physics are doing is giving us what are the conceptual tools that we need in order to grasp non-perceptual, non-first level causal connections. But the point is that grasping the law, grasping that the universe is causal, that is perceptual from cases where causality is perceptual. And that is things like my pushing a ball causes it to roll. With that in mind, let's come back to this, uh, what causality really gives us. And that is that causality is giving us a natural view of the universe. It's what we'll see in the next section is giving us the view, uh, it's allowing to, us to reject this view that the universe is that which is shaped by consciousness, that that things do what they do because of the will of God or you know the desire of the rain to fall to the ground. And instead we can grasp that the universe is operating based on the identities of that which exists. It's what allows us to see that the question of, okay, there's a universe, but why is it orderly is as ridiculous as the question and meaningless as the question of why is there something instead of nothing that inherent in existence exists is existence is identity and in saying existence is identity we are also saying that existence is causal existence is orderly it has to be because a disorderly universe would be a universe of contradictions of entities acting not in accordance with their nature and so this view of of reality as causal is going to permeate objectivism and uh, particularly and it should permeate your view of life the way that and I mentioned this at the outset the core of the objectivist ethics is being what Ayn Rand calls a disciple of causation it is you know never desiring effects without causes or causes without effects and certainly not reversing those two so really important principle. We saw that there are some areas of disagreement about how to formulate it, but we saw that there's a fundamental agreement that um, that what causality gives us is that a thing cannot act in contradiction to its nature. And, and, that, uh, and, and that is really the perspective that's going to shape our understanding of causality going forward. So talk next time. Remember to like this video, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and as always, stay up to date on my latest by going to donswriting.com and signing up for the newsletter. Talk to you next time.